Morning. I just want to read the scripture, first of all. It's from Jeremiah 28 to 11. For when I spoke, I cried out, I shouted, violence and plunder. Because the word of the Lord was made to me a reproach and a derision on a daily basis. Then I said, I will not make mention of him, nor speak any more in his name. But his word was in my heart like a burning fire, shut up in my bones. I was weary of holding it back, and I could not. For I heard many mocking, fear on every side. Report, they said, and we will report it. All my acquaintances watched for my stumbling, saying, Perhaps he can be induced. Then we will prevail against him, and we will take our revenge on him. But the Lord is with me as a mighty, awesome one. Therefore, my persecutors will stumble, and I will prevail. They will be greatly ashamed, for they will not prosper. Their everlasting confusion will never be forgotten. I just want us to pray over that scripture. Heavenly Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity once more of studying your word and bringing our praises and worship before your heavenly throne. Lord, you know the chaotic condition of our planet, global warming, fire, floods, mudslides, earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, disease, wars. We pray that you intervene, Father, and bring peace, harmony and love back to our planet. We pray for the lost who have turned their backs on you, who have never known you, and pray for a mighty move of your Holy Spirit to bring them to you. We pray for your church through the world, throughout the world, Lord, some who face horrendous persecution. Strengthen and embolden their faith and perseverance for sharing your word, their patience to wait upon you and their passion to glorify your name no matter what trials they face until the time of your son's return. I pray that you bless this message of your word this morning and we welcome you, Holy Spirit, into our midst. In Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, this is a bit like déjà vu. I feel like I've already said this once, which I have this morning. But <clears throat> I was telling the earlier congregation of how best to describe God's, pow um, God's power and fire to you. So when I was sitting there, the, the, the Lord showed me the sun, which would depict his power. And what a sunburst from the sun would be. So all the consuming fire of the sun, when you get a little sunburst come off, that would be us, if we know the Lord. You also showed me a barbecue where you got this big container full of coals, you set it to light, big flames. That would be God. But every single little cold, that would be you. But we'd need someone to look after the fire because otherwise everything there would be burnt to pieces. That would be Jesus. He would be turning to make sure that you are ready. And then in time, the right time, the Holy Spirit will take you off the fire for, for you to go on to the next stage, which unfortunately for the hamburger is to be eaten. But in your lives, it would be to go into your ministry. So this morning, we were talking about Jeremiah. And Jeremiah is called the weeping prophet because his entire ministry, five decades, 
the Lord told him bad news to tell to Israel. He was told to tell Israel that because they're not repenting, because they're continually um, sinning, because the king wouldn't listen to him, that he was going to exile his entire nation into uh, Babylon. And they heard, and they tried to get out of it. They even tried to convince him not to say it if if that was going to make some kind of difference. But it didn't. It says, <clears throat> I'm just trying to find that now. Um, For I heard them mocking, fear on every side, report, all my acquaintances watch for my stumbling. So everyone that knew Jeremiah, they weren't his friend. Because he wasn't saying what he wanted them to say. He was telling them a message that was not what they wanted to hear. So Jeremiah, over five decades, he was put into prison, put down a well, sinking in the mud. They put him in stocks. And for five decades, he warned the... Well, this this was Judah... He warned Judah of what would happen to them. And then, when all the uh, Jews went to Babylon, he, he, he didn't have to go with them. He went to Egypt. And then he was killed. Right, so after prophesying for so long, he was stoned to death after five decades of royal servitude to God. To do something like that, you need a special passion, a special fire inside you. And that's why he says, Because the word of the Lord was made to me a reproach, but his word is like a burning fire. Okay, and I, I can save it from my own side, but no matter how much, uh, sometimes I get lazy and I say, oh, Lord, I'm not going to get my bike today, I'm not going to do this, I'm not going to do that. And then I feel so guilty because that's not what God wants me to do. He wants me to get on the bike. He wants, he's, he's arranged for me to, right in the middle of the, of the stick somewhere, he's arranged for me to meet that biker because I need to pray for him so that he comes to know Jesus. And a a lot of the times, uh, you can take Jonah. Jonah didn't agree with God. He says, no, 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 those people don't deserve to be prayed for. They don't deserve to be preached to. And he tried to escape. He, He got on a boat going in the opposite direction. God says, yeah, this is going to be a difficult one. Chuck him over the side, let my fish bring him back. There he goes, now go do my will. And he saved that city. Alright. It was later lost again, but that wasn't Jonah's problem. All Jonah had to do was tell the city, which he did, and they repented. A lot of times, as Christians, we feel disheartened. I know with friends... They, they call us Bible punches. They don't want anything else to do with us. We're no more fun. We don't drink. We don't um, participate in the same kind of entertainments that they do. And slowly but surely, you start losing all those friends. Okay. I was saying to the congregation this morning, all my friends that I knew, every single one of them, I no longer have anything to do with them. Well, and they with me. So now I've got a new bunch of friends, Christian friends, and we do the same thing together. So the people did scoff and they did put, do some bad stuff to Jeremiah, but he was always, always obedient to God in the end. But if we fast forward, because he was a great man 
in the Old Testament, but you've got great men in the New Testament as well. And one of them was Timothy. Timothy was a sickly person. It wasn't really cut out for the, the arduous journeys that Paul took him on, but he did it because he had a fire inside him. That gospel couldn't be contained. He had to tell the world about that fire. But he was young. And Paul took him under his wing, his protege, and started teaching him. And I know you guys are, are um, studying 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy. Right? But Paul spent time with him. Paul was in prison. He was about to be beheaded. But he continued teaching Timothy. Paul said he doesn't care about death because in death he'll go to Jesus. If he doesn't go to Jesus, then he's alive and he'll continue ministering. So he doesn't care which one. And that's what he taught Timothy. And Timothy eventually was made the bishop of Ephesus. And that was one of the first Bible schools in the uh, New World. He was a bishop. He served faithfully there until his 80th birthday. Then he tried to stop a pagan ritual and they stoned him to death as well. And if you have a look at the martyrs, all the apostles, they all, apart from John, they were all killed. And then a lot of the early Christians, that 3,000 Christians, where Peter um, preached to them, they were all baptized in the Spirit. They were, most of them, not all of them, most of them ended up in Roman entertainment arenas, feeding lions, um, being sacrificed. Okay? So, if Paul, uh, yeah, if, if Paul came to you and says, okay, I've got a great thing for you this morning, right, you can come, become a Christian and get eaten by a lion. Or you can become a Christian and they can saw you in half. Volunteers, please. How many people are going to do that? Not many. You'd be crazy to do something like that. But they did it. Right? Because they had a fire inside of them. Okay? It's a small fire. But when you get born again, it's a tiny fire inside of you. You know something has changed in your lives. I can remember a, a, as a non-Christian, a non-believer, I had this emptiness inside me. And I was saying, well, I didn't say Lord. I said, why do I feel so empty? Let me fill it. Let me pour, it, pour alcohol into it. Let, let me get rid of this feeling. But you can't. <clears throat> and then I became a Christian. That feeling, it was still there, but now I had purpose. I knew what that feeling was. I had to go share with people what had happened to me. I had to share the love of Jesus to everyone. <clears throat> he, Timothy continued his fight against false doctrine and opposition. On his 80th year, he was stoned to death. And all those early Christians, they all governed their lives basically by three letters. All th basically one letter, but three times. And that was the three Ps. Passion, patience, and perseverance. With passion, the definition of passion is an intense desire or enthusiasm for something. So if we take the word enthusiasm, it comes from two Greek words, en, meaning in or within, and heos, meaning God. So those two words mean in God. Another definition I saw, passion is the inner spark provided by God's Holy Spirit that ignites you to your God-given purpose. Okay, so that, that's the passion. Passion 
with fire. So let's have a look at what fire says. Fire of God. The, it's a burning passion which exists in the hearts of those who are committed to serving God. So if you look at that definition, the definition said in God. The fire of God is saying the burning passion to serve Him. The fire of Jesus. Jesus said, I come to cast fire upon the earth. That sounds quite ap apocalyptic. Apocalyptic. Right? Um, almost sounds like Sodom and Gomorrah. But that's not what it's saying. It says, I come to cast fire upon the earth and would that it were already kindled, I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how I am constrained until it is accomplished. So Jesus is saying, while I'm on earth, I really can't do that much. But when I go back to heaven, which is where I want to be, I can then put everyone, or ho hopefully everyone, in God again and bring them back to, to heaven. All right? But he needed to go to heaven first. He couldn't do it whilst he was with us. The fire of the Holy Spirit. So you got the disciples, quite a few disciples were in a small room um, and then the Holy Spirit came to them, rushing wind. But <coughs> it says... Uh, Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll just stick to my notes. The last time I, I didn't stick to my notes. Right. The Holy Spirit, cleansing and purification, it is more than a symbol. Material fire is the symbol and the fire of the Spirit is the reality. The whole universe is alive with a divine living spiritual energy that consumes God is an all-consuming fire and it consumes all the dross of sense and materiality and it's a fire that burns eternally. So you've got all, with, with the Holy Spirit, you've got these people in this room and they all get a flame on top of their heads. They start speaking in tongues. Peter goes out into the street, 3,000 people. He preaches one sermon, 3,000 people are saved. Yeah? That's the power of the Holy Spirit. That's the fire of the Holy Spirit working through Peter. Then you get the fire of the, um, of the prophets. A true prophet is someone who's been set on fire by the Spirit of God. He is one who has made a complete offering of himself to God. One who not only proclaims the fire of God's love, but also reverences the God who is a consuming fire. He is the one whose heart has been strangely warmed and can speak even though it will make him unpopular and unacceptable to every false prophet and anybody else that is in contention with God. I've just finished reading um, Isaiah, Jeremiah and Ezekiel. Very powerful messages. I wonder what it would have been like to be that man hearing God giving messages to a nation. I can only, I, even if I imagine, I'll never ever get the true picture of that. Right? I'll never get the true picture of Moses hiding in that cliff and seeing the presence, the glory of God walking past him. Right, where he comes off the mountain and he's shining from God's glory. And he's going down to a disobedient people that even though they can see on the mountain the thunder and the lightning and, and they know God's there, they're busy making a golden calf. Right? If I go back to Jeremiah, 
When I spoke, I cried, violence and plunder. Because the word of the Lord was made to me a reproach and a derision. They said, don't speak to me anymore about it. They didn't want to listen. All right. Timothy, as a protege, he set up this um, university in Ephesus. Paul saw in him a, a, a special power, a, a special passion, that fire within him. He told Peter, uh, Timothy, he gave him instruction of how to keep the church on track. Because the church, although in, in the early days it was all about the Holy Spirit guiding and teaching everyone, the church started getting corrupted, it started changing, false prophets came in, um, new doctrine was introduced, and Paul was concerned about this, and he said to Timothy, even when I'm gone, you must watch this church, you must keep it on track, teach my doctrine, which is the doctrine that Jesus gave. Paul writes to Timothy, and from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. So these words are relevant to us today. We find ourselves in a godless society where governments are making laws to prevent the gospel being preached. I saw on the news the other night that there was one school in America um, that, that has rebelled and is saying that they're now going to say the Lord's Prayer in their assemblies. That made headline news. When I was in school, no one would have thought twice about it because every single school used to say the Lord's Prayer. That's how much the law has changed. <clears throat> so, where governments are making laws to prevent the gospel from being preached and is promoting a lifestyle totally contrary to what the Bible teaches. All right. <clears throat> God was very specific in sexual morality issues, right? And now we've got a society where what they did in Sodom and Gomorrah, we can no longer complain about it. If we do, then we will be charged with a hate crime. That's how much the laws change. The Christian their Christian values they're not allowed to pre, uh, practice anymore because if we practice them and we go up to the sinner and say you're wrong but God can still save you then we're being uh, discriminating against that person. And it's not only this country <coughs> most European West country uh, it, it, in Eastern Europe <coughs> people who don't believe in God right if you, let's call it old values, if you're a sodomite, then you'll be executed. But in a Christian country, if you're a sodomite, you'll be praised. You've got freedom. Have your little festivals in Brighton and wherever else you have them. We're not allowed to say anything about it. But that's not God's way. All right? <clears throat> so, preventing gospel being preached and is promoting a lifestyle totally contrary to what the Bible teaches. It is becoming more and more the accepted norm to reject the teachings of the Bible in our society, which makes us very unpopular with the local communities. It is more important in our time to preach the gospel because time is running out. The words of Jeremiah tell us that in the end days, God will judge each nation and its people. 
Jeremiah and Timothy both had a mission to bring the people back to God, as do we. Right? So, that, that's all about passion. The passion inside you to get something done. The commitment to God. Not to bow down. Not to, to compromise. To do what God has told you to do. It'll start with a spark. And the more you read the word, the more you pray about it, the bigger that spark will, and then it will burst into flame. And God can now say, I know you are now ready Go out there and say my word. But then you have to have patience as well because it can take quite a long time for God to get you to that place. So if you have a look in the Old Testament, the prophets, kings, disciples, or this New Testament, um, Jeremiah, he was 20. He was chosen from birth, but it, he, he only became a practicing prophet at the age of 20. David was 18. Moses was 80. Jesus and John the Baptist were 30. Although Jesus used to go into the synagogue at 12, that wasn't to minister. That was to learn. All had one thing in common. They were called early, as we are, each one of us, and then taught by God. There's a, there's a teaching period. They had to wait upon the Father who then released them into the ministry. So you have that candle flame burning inside you. But God says, okay, I'll keep it small because I need to teach you. And when I finish teaching that, then I'll start with, with uh, uh, adding oxygen to that flame and it'll get bigger and bigger and bigger and then I can use you. It says, the Bible teaches us, Colossians 3, 12, 13, we are encouraged to clothe ourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. So we use patience when dealing with others. We're reminded to be patient with those who may be difficult or challenging to love. It's easy to love someone your family member, your wife, your kids. It's easy to love them. But what about that person that when every time you see him, you think, ah, oh, I wish I wasn't a Christian right now because I'd really like to do something to that person. And instead you walk up to the person and say, hey, Jesus loves you. Can I pray with you? That's what he's talking about. You, you, you've got to cultivate that patience so that when the time is right, God can use you in that capacity. The Bible teaches us that patience is an important aspect of our spiritual growth. I, I became a Christian in 1982. In 2012, I started going to, the, first of all, Bible college, because I just wanted a diploma, and that diploma kicked into being uh, a BA, and I thought, well, that's me finished. Won't do any more studying, I'm getting too old for this lock. And then I had to do my master's. So I did my master's, and I thought, sure, now I'm at the top of the, the tree, I don't have to any more studying to do. Now I've been told to go to Spurgeon's and start studying all over again, but specifically for the Baptist Church. So here I am, my age, going to school again. But God is teaching me. He's saying, hey, be patient. You have a ministry. You want your ministry to grow. You need this in your life. Because it's not me that's going to continue my ministry. I'm the founder of the ministry. I have to teach my members, who are God's members, I have to teach them so that when I get called home, there's somebody there that can take over. Because otherwise what happens to the ministry? It folds. Right? 
So my job is to prepare them. It's their job to grow the ministry, to take it forward. Yeah. So it's been a long journey for me. The problem, ministry would be beautiful. and I don't mean this nasty. Ministry would be perfect if it wasn't for the people. If you could walk into the church and you could pray and you can sing and you could do everything with God, you'd be a very happy person. But then the congregation walks through the door, or as in my case, my members walk through the door, and now you have to deal with the human element. And you're saying, hey, I'm on fire for God. Let's go ride. And I said, no, I don't feel that well today. You know, my wife has told me I must be back at 2 o'clock because she wants to go shopping. And, and they start making all these excuses. And I've got a thing on my phone that I post quite often to my guys. On day 20, I say, who's going to go for a ride? Yes, they all say. On day 15, who's going for a ride? 15 of them. On day 10, who's coming for the ride? 10 of them. And so it goes down. And then on day one, I say, right, who's coming for the ride? I'm going for the ride. The rest have all made excuses. So we, we built up. I mean, it was quite large. We built it up. And then I made them sign a constitution where it says, if you don't ride with us at least once a month, then you can't be a member anymore. And I lost three quarters of the members because they couldn't ride for Jesus one day a month. All they did was make excuses. But now I've got a good core. Because now I say to these guys, you want to go for a ride? And I look at them and say, yeah, okay, Alan, yes, we will go for a ride. I say, okay, I'm not going to let you come to me. I'm going to come pick you up, make sure you get on your motorbike, and then we're going to go for a ride. So, new rules, but it works now. It's like me saying, okay, are you coming to church? And you'll say, yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, OK, I'm coming in the bus and I'm going to come pick every single one of you up and make sure you're here. All right? Then I know that the congregation will be here. Yeah? So, we've spoken about passion. We've spoken about patience. Then there's perseverance. All right, I'm just going to read this to you. It's from James 1. 3 to 4. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. Then 2 Timothy 2.12. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. So, you want to be a good Christian? How many trials and tribulations have you had to deal with? Because the more trials and tribulations that Satan throws against you, the more you're ranking in the Christian world, and I'm not saying that, that's what the Bible says, the, the more higher you become in the heavenly army. Because Satan... He's not worried about a lukewarm Christian. You're no danger to him. He's looking at the committed Christians, the Christians with fire inside that will get up at 3 o'clock in the morning and say, Lord, I want this hour of prayer with you. Satan will be looking at a person who says, I'm, getting, oh, I'm going to use the motorbike industry. He's getting on his bike again. Where's he going? Oh, he's going to a big meeting. There's three, four thousand bikers there. He's going to grab one of them. I know he's going to grab. I'm going to stop him. I'll throw rocks in the road. I'll pour oil on the road. And God, with his angels protecting you, guys, you through all that. And you get to that bike meet, and you just see thousands of bikers. And you look at one of them, and you think, oh, I need to go speak to that man. You go up to him and say, 
do you know that Jesus loves you? And he says, yes, I do, but I need someone to tell me more. So, well, I'm that person. Let's go have a chat. He, he will organise all that for you. Satan hates it. Right? Because you're listening to God. Okay? But you need that fire. You need that perseverance because it doesn't happen overnight. The more you're obedient to God, the more you read his word, which is your preparation, the more he can use you. And you'll be amazed at where he can take you. I have been discouraged many times. I've gone before the Lord and declared, Lord, I've had enough. Members don't listen to me. They don't communicate with me. They don't participate. They're not committed. Close this ministry down. I'll go join CMA. That's what I felt like doing. Lord has said, Nah, I gave you this passion. I gave you this ministry. I will teach you. He's still teaching me. I, in turn, must teach the members. Because he's not... The Lord isn't promoting me into anything. And so it's like with Moses. Moses didn't go to the promised land. It was Joshua. All right? So, okay, uh, I don't want to be irreverent to, to anyone... But I'm like Moses because I can only take part of the journey. I'm looking for the Joshua who's going to take the ministry forward. And he's there somewhere, or she, doesn't have to be a he, right? Somewhere out there is the leader of rapture riders that Jesus is going to expand the ministry with. It's not me. I'm just teaching the leaders so that they can start their ministries. So it's a great thing. Right? And I, I'm happy with that. My fire is being maintained by me teaching other people. Okay? <clears throat> okay, so in conclusion... Each one of us that's a born again, spiritual Christian, some of us are called to be volunteers, elders, pastors, some of us are travelling evangelists, or they've given you a particular skill to use. It could be you're the only person in the congregation that can look after the church's plumbing. That's your skill. That's what God will use you for. Maybe you're a Sunday school teacher. You don't know it yet, but you've got this ability to bond, relate with kids, scripturally. God will show you that. Right? But what you need to do <clears throat> is you need to tell God that you're prepared to do it. You need to seek Him and say, show me. What do you want me to do? And once he's told you, then you need to do it. You, may, you don't come to church on a Sunday for one hour and think, okay, that's please God. See you next week. Same time, same place. Now I'm going back to the world. I'll go play my golf. Have a drink with my buddies. Do this, that, that. Come back to church. That, that's, that's not being a Christian. Right? Yes, you believe in Jesus. Okay? But if you love God, you will do His will. And what did Jesus say your, His will is? He said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. That's His will. Alright? So, don't don't be a lukewarm Christian. You must study the word daily. You must pray daily. You must look at your family and say, are they all Christians? I'm, I'm talking about your immediate family and then your not so immediate family. Brothers, sisters, aunties, uncles. 
Are they Christians? No. Has anyone told them about Jesus? No. Hey, my job's not done yet. I need to speak to them. Right? I, I started with my father. He, he was the most difficult nut to crack. I convinced my father. Well, I didn't convince him of anything. Jesus did. <clears throat> he was born again. He was baptised. And because he'd done it, then he's talking to my mother. She was born again. She was baptised. And then my brother-in-law said, Oh, God is speaking to me. And then his wife, my sister... And then my brother. And so it went on. Every single member of my family, my kids, my kid says, no, we don't want any of that. Dad, that's boring stuff. I don't like their music. Blah, 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 blah. Every single one of my kids is baptised, speaks in tongues, prays, has seen miracles in their lives. Because I took time to listen to God and God said, hey, your children, what are the duties of a pastor? What are the duties of a husband? What are the duties of a wife? What are your duties to your children? So these children that are given the right to choose their lifestyle, the parents are failing them. Because that's not what God says. God says, I want the children to be Christians. There's no choice. That's what God wants. Yeah. So, <clears throat> you bring up Christian families, you love your neighbour, that's difficult sometimes, but you love them, you support the body of Christ, this is the body of Christ, not this, this is a building, right, this is the body of Christ. So, you hear that someone's poorly, I've heard it in this church this morning. Right? Someone's poorly. If someone wants to go visit him, then that's acceptable. He would appreciate your visit. So he, he should put a, a big barricade on his door now because every single member here should be trying to fight him to go see that guy and lifting him up before the Lord. That's what should be happening. Right? If you, if you hear someone's got a financial problem, you don't have to go give him money. Maybe the Lord tells you to do that. But you don't give him money. Right? You go and say, listen, brother, sister, me and here's another person, we are now going to pray. Because where two or three are gathered together, big things happen. And your finances will come right. But in whose timing? In God's timing. Not his timing. Right, uh, I, I, I've been to prosperity churches. I, I've seen the big rip-offs that these churches do. You'll get a million pound by the end of the year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, but I've already given nearly a million pound to the church to get the million back if I get it back. All right, that's not God. All right, if you want to believe uh, finances in marriage, uh, in if you want to believe in a miracle in your finances, tithe. That's what God says. And he will reproduce back to you. Maybe not in money, because you don't need money. Maybe you need love. Maybe you need... Um, I'm believing that I'm going to have a church. I'm going to have a headquarters for rapture riders. The Lord said, ask and it will be given to you. I'm doing the Lord's work and I'm saying, Lord, that's what I want if it's your will. If it's not your will, that's fine. I'll carry on the way I am. But miracles will happen. I'll, t I'll tell you this as well. I was driving my car and I, and I made the mistake that I thought I knew how much petrol I had. I didn't bother looking at the petrol gate. And I got halfway down the road, highway, uh, I got into, you know, like M25 parking. It's the biggest parking ground in the world. Got blocked there. And I'm look, I looked at my petrol gauge and it was on yellow. And it started flashing. And I had about 15 miles to go. I said, Lord, please, don't let me get stuck on this highway. 
So I, sw I switched the engine off, so now the petrol is not shown. Uh, but my radio, well, my CD player was still playing, and it was playing gospel music. So I started singing with the gospel music while I'm in this roadblock. And I thought, man, because this is what this music was all about. And I said, man, I really wished that what they're saying there happened in my life. And I was talking about how God fulfills your prayers. So I turned my ignition back on because the traffic was just beginning to move. And I looked at my petrol and it was on half tank. All right. Switch it off. It was empty. Switch it on. After I sang, all right, after I'd praised and worshipped God, I switched it on and it was on half. All right. I could go three times as much um, further than, than I hoped to. All right. That's God working. All right. So, <clears throat> to finish off, I just want to pray for us all. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this message you have given us today. We ask the Holy Spirit to turn that little spark in us to a raging burning fire, that we may serve you, obey you, and do your will here on earth. Lord, I bring the people of this congregation before you now. I ask the members of this congregation, do you have something in your hearts for the Lord? Something that persists, you cannot ignore. Something that you've been suppressing, that you, you're pushing it deep down into your being, but it keeps rising up. Something the Lord wants you to do, and you keep on ignoring it. Then today is the day. I pray today that you no longer ignore it. You ask the Lord to help you, that you answer his call, that you tell him, yes, Lord, here I am. I am listening, Lord. I want to do what you've asked me to do. Ignite that spark. Let me be filled with your fire. Make that commitment today. And as we go into this new week, if you have got that feeling inside you, then I want you to speak to the elders afterwards. Tell them what God is saying to you. Let them pray with you. And then during the next week, I pray that the Lord will be with each and every one of you. He blesses you. He uses you. That he teaches you. And that you are obedient to him and brings you joy and peace. In Jesus' name I pray this. Amen.